All right, let's go. So today we have a, I think, <laughs> interesting class with different opinions and different ideas. The truth is I'm not an authority to say this is the right way of doing, of doing things, this is the wrong way of doing things. My, my mission in this case is to present different ideas, different possibilities, and I believe each case has to be dealt with independently. That means a person should have, a person, I mean Jew or not Jew, which actually is the same thing, a person, a person should have a guide. And through this guidance, go through with, the, with this guidance. Sometimes you're going to like what, whatever you get as guidance. Sometimes you're not going to like it, but it has to be like consistent. Of course, just like any doctor, you can say, okay, I don't like this doctor anymore. I, I want to go to a different doctor. Or sometimes you get different, when you want different opinions. If in the, in the things of the body, you need different opinions to see, do you actually make a surgery, don't make a surgery? In the, in the things of the soul, of course, there are many opinions. And sometimes you want to hear different opinions. But once you hear these different opinions, it's important to have a guidance to say, look, I heard this, 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 and that. This rabbi told me this. This rabbi told me that. This rabbi said this. Based on this, this, and that, what should I do? <laughs> and according to the, to the level where the person is holding in his connection to God, in his connection to the precepts, mitzvahs, etc., according to that, hopefully, <laughs> with, with a lot of, in, in the Aramaic, Hebrew, we say, sayata dishmaya, with the help of God, with the help of the heaven, so you're going to get the right guidance, the one that is sent actually for you specifically. Specifically, That's why it's difficult, many times difficult, to give a class on this particular subject because people think that whatever you say applies to every case, in every situation, in all the cases, and it's tough. It's, and it's really tough. And what, what makes it more difficult, really, this is the main uh, place where the difficulty is, there's not much written about this, the issue. If there's a lot of text and then there's a lot of people arguing about this, so you can get an easy way, easy path to understand what the truth is. Let's call it truth, whatever, whatever it means. But since there's not so much written about this, and the reason why is very simple, to write about, write about these subjects many years ago, 300 years ago, 500 and, and, and back, was virtually death. A, a rabbi could not publish a book talking about non-Jews because what are you, you're talking about us? We're going to kill you. That's it. So we don't have so much written about these issues. And you have to pick and choose, pick here, there. And maybe he wanted to say this or that and start interpreting it. And it's not easy. So what's the subject that we're going to talk about today? The subject is, can non-Jews fulfill the mitzvot, the precepts of Jews. That's the idea I want to present today. Again, there's no right answer or wrong answer. It depends on the case. Actually, one of the, at least I find it, one of the most beautiful things about Judaism and the way of learning of Judaism is we are in the, actually in the, in the Western world, I say we because I live in the Western world also, but whatever, there's all kinds of people, all kinds of places. In the Western world, we, we're used to binary logic. Either you're right or you're wrong. I'm a person that worked lots, many years in computers. I still work in computers, whatever. So ones and zeros, ones and zeros, either right or wrong. That's it. It's correct or wrong. No middle path. In When you when you start really learning Talmud and Judaism and then delving into it really deeply, you're going to find that that's not the right logic. <laughs> that's not the logic Judaism follows. The logic, logic is both opinions are right, actually. They express different aspects of godliness. Only that in certain cases, godliness shows itself, reveals itself in this way. So you should follow this authority. And in certain different cases, godliness shows itself, reveals itself in a different way. So you should follow this other opinion. So who's right and who's wrong? Both are right. And maybe in some cases, both are wrong. There's a third opinion. <laughs> oh, so you go crazy. You don't know where to stand. <laughs> That's why I say main thing. And the first of all is 
to have a particular guidance, somebody you can ask, and somebody that can ideally know you, understand you, know a little bit of your story, and say, I think that for your particular case, the answer would be ta-ta-ta, or the, the path to follow would be pa-pa-pa, etc. Even, it even happens within Judaism, at least, that sometimes a person calls a rabbi with a question, specific question on anything, the rabbi answers the question, and somebody else calls with the same question, and the rabbi answers differently. And then they speak between them, hey, to me the rabbi said yes, and to you, to you the rabbi says no. Are you crazy? The rabbi is crazy. So wait a second. In this particular case, this is correct. In this particular case, this is not correct. It's very simple. And of course, the rabbi should be able to provide the, the sources. Why do you say this? Okay, you want to say why? We can see it and we can learn. And I'm going to show you why I said why. And of course, this I shouldn't even say it, but we can make mistakes. Of course, we can make mistakes and we can say, we we'll go back and say, okay, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. The answer should be ta ta ta, depending on the case. All of this said, <clears throat> let's go, let's go into it. I'm not going to read all the sources inside because th this would take like five hours or even more. So I'm not going to do that. There are, there's one source I want to read, but because actually many of the, of the ideas are based on this source on how you understand this particular source. This source is called Rambam. Rambam was called Reb Moshe ben Maimon. He lived in Spain, year one, 1100s. <laughs> yeah, I got stuck with the years. 1100s in Spain. He wrote many things. He was a very, very special person. Definitely, it's a it's a subject on itself. Who was the rabbi, the, the Rambam, etc. But he, one of the books he wrote. It's called Yada Hazaka. In, in English, it would be called like the strong hand because the word hand in Hebrew is called Yad, Yud Dalet, which actually adds up to 14. It's a book comprised of 14 books. So that's why it's called like the 14, strong 14, whatever. Yada Hazaka, Mishneh Torah, it's also called that way. There, at the end of the book, he writes all the laws, I mean, all, at least, in quote, uh, all the laws, all the laws of Bnei Noyach. It's the only, it's the only one that actually writes all the laws of all Judaism at all, from, from the beginning to the end, so to speak, which includes, of course, the Bnei Noyach. And interestingly speaking about this, he writes the laws of Bnei Noyach close, really close. It's like the last four chapters of the whole book, the last, uh, the second to last, so to speak to speak about Bnei Noyach, and the last two speak about Mashiach, Messiah. So it's really connected one thing to the other, because once the whole world, everybody, I mean, Jews and non-Jews, understand and live and Mashiach, Messiah, so that's going to actually bring him and reveal God in the earth, etc. So it's actually interesting. The Rama was very special mind. Even the, the order in which he wrote things, that has teachings. So here we have a very specific thing in the order. First Bnei Noyach, then Moshiach. So what we're doing is actually bringing close the, the Moshiach. Uh, there he writes the following thing. I'm going to read for you to you inside, just a second. Okay. This is in chapter 10, the law number nine. I'm not going to read the whole law because it talks about other things, which also is a subject on itself. So for, for a different time, I'm not uh, I'm not saying this should not be treated and should not be explained. It should be explained. It talks about Shabbos, Shabbat, talks about the learning of Torah for non-Jews. We can make a class on that. Let's not dwell on that. See, so he, wrote, he writes like this. The general idea is like this. I'm reading it from inside. The chapter 10 of Laws of Kings and the law is number 9. The general thing is like this. We, we means like the ruling Jewish court or whatever, that today doesn't exist, or whatever. We, uh, we don't let them make a chidush. Chidush means like a novelty. We, don't, we do not allow them to make new religion or to make mitzvot, precepts, by themselves because they want to. What, what does that mean? Very simple. Let's say a person makes up that taking the cell phone and raising it three times, that is what God says to us that we should do. 
And everybody starts raising the phone three times in the day, three times in the morning, three times in the afternoon. Where do you get that from? I don't know. It's, it's nice. It's a cell phone. We don't, know, we don't allow this. You want to call this your religion or whatever religion? Fine. Don't say this is what Judaism teaches. It's not. It's not written anywhere. Again, there are many religions around. Everybody says whatever you want to say. Islam is there and Buddhism is there. Hinduism, okay, do whatever you want. But don't say that this is a godly commandment to Jews to spread around. No, 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 no. That's not written anywhere. But that's what the Rambam is talking about. We don't let them like invent, make up new ideas. Rather, either you convert and accept all the precepts, all the, the commandments, all the mitzvot, or you stay in your Torah, in your teachings of seven laws, etc. Don't add anything. Don't take out anything. And whomever do, does anything else also includes Shabbat, resting. I'm not going to dwell into this. Or study Torah. We tell them this is wrong and you're going to be punished by God. Next law. Number 10. We just read number 9. So don't don't do anything else than the seven things. This is what the Rambam just said. Number 9. I'm sorry, that was number 9. Number 10. Ben Noyach, non-Jew, who wants to do a mitzvah, a precept, of the rest of the mitzvot of the, of the Torah, that means that, that that doesn't include Shabbos to rest on the seventh day and does not include learning Torah, which actually we're learning Torah. But don't worry, we're doing something right. So a non-Jew that wants to do something else, something more than what the seven percent, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, seven commandments, because he wants to receive reward. This is this is the exact text that the Rama writes. He wants to receive reward. It doesn't say which kind of reward. We do not uh, prevent him of doing it properly. That means you want to do it, you have to do it right. What does that mean, right? Just like the laws of the jury of the Jews. You have to do it properly. And if, if he wants to bring, he or she, it's exactly the same thing. If he wants to bring a, a sacrifice to the temple, we don't have the temple today, we receive the sacrifice. If he wants to give tzedakah, he wants to help somebody else with money, we receive it. And I think we give it to the poor of the Jews. This is basically the, the main thing. The text continues, but we're not losing anything if I don't explain it. You can find it actually in English, in any language. It's readily available. So this is what Rama says. We just said you should not do anything else than the seven things. And then immediately afterwards we say, if you want to do something else, okay, go do it. Do it properly, but go do it. No problem. So what are we saying? Should I do more or should I not do more? What's the, what's the conclusion of this? So the idea is very simple. Before explaining this, one comment on the Rambam. I want to tell you, uh, this is the last source we're going to read. One comment. This comment, oh, what did I do? This comment is from the Radvaz. The Radvaz was called David Ben Zimri. Uh, what did I put it? Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't find it here right now, but whatever. I'm going to tell you outside. The Radvaz was called David Ben Zimri. He lived in Egypt, years 1500s. He was the teacher of the Arizal. Arizal was a great Kabbalist. So we're talking about a, the teacher of him, a great guy. In, very, very impressive mind. So the Radvaz writes, what is this thing of doing precepts because he wants to receive reward? We know that there's such a thing as God commanding you to do something and you do it. Or God the, not commanding you to do something, and you do it anyway. You do it anyway because you want to do it. You want to whatever, do more than what you're supposed to be doing. These two ideas, Jews have 613 commandments. That's okay. You have, you have to do many things. You have to not do many things. And non-Jews have only seven things. So the question is, I want to do more than what I'm commanded to do. What you're commanded to do, you have to do it. Whether you like it, you like it or not, we believe in God, etc., etc. But I want to do more things. Can I do it or not? So the Radvaz writes clearly, even though I don't have the text with me right now, the Radvaz writes, if an Anju wants to do other mitzvot, he can do it. She can do it, he can do the same. He can do it, no problem, as long as he does not do it 
because God commanded that he should do it. Because that's not true. God did not say you should do this. It's not written. You should do seven things. You want to do more? You can do it. As long as you're clear in your mind that you're not commanded to do it. Then the Radvaz comments on this idea of receiving re reward. What kind of reward do you, do you receive? God only gives reward if you if he commands you to do something and you do it. So he gives you reward. If you're not supposed to do something and you do it, why should I give you reward? <laughs> I didn't ask you to do it. So the Radvaz writes, the reward is a lower level of reward, whatever that means. Nobody knows how to explain this. Forget it. But it's a lower level of reward. Actually, this is not only in the Radvaz, this is only in the, also in the Zoya. It says, the Zoya is a book of Kabbalah. In the Zoya in Ruth, it says that there's a Gan Eden, a paradise, whatever, reward for Jews. And there's a different Gan Eden, paradise for non-Jews. What's the difference? Nobody knows. It's not written anywhere. Forget it. You're not going to find it. You can look, but you're not going to find it. Nobody knows the difference. But whatever. This is, this is the reward. Whatever the reward is. So it's a lower level of reward. Why is it a lower level? Actually, it sounds strange. Because if you are commanded to do something, let's say we believe in God, thank God, uh, there's a, one God, he commands many things, so I go and do it because I believe on him. Okay, so you get a reward. But if I am not commanded to do and I do more than what I'm commanded to do, apparently the reward should be higher. You're not supposed to be doing it. You're not obligated to do it. And you do it anyway. Great. What? Should be higher even if you're commanded to do it. So why is it a lower level of reward? To understand this, we need to know what a mitzvah, what a commandment means. The word mitzvah actually means commandment. It's an order. God says, and you go do it. However, when you go deeper a little bit in what a mitzvah means, mitzvah comes from the word Aramaic word, safta, which means connection. It means a connection. We, as human beings, limited human beings, we cannot make a connection with the infinite, with God. We're nothing in front of him. He can make a connection with us, telling us, go do this for me, or don't do that because I say. So what's a mitzvah? A mitzvah is actually a connection. And that connection comes from him to us. It's like a one direction thing, from up, down. S given so, since this is so, if he commands you to do something and you do it, so you get the reward of the connection. The connection is the reward. But if he did not command to do, and you do it anyway, who told you you have a connection? Okay, you did something that is, let's call it nice in the eyes of God, whatever the case is. But you don't have the connection. So that's why the reward is lower. Should I say you have no connection at all? Okay, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. But do you have the same level of or, or kind of connection you would have if you were commanded to do it? No. That's for sure you don't have it. This is what the Radvaz writes. Right. Commenting on what the Rambam says, you can receive a reward. You want to do this because you want to receive a reward. So the, Rambam, the Radvaz says, okay, but the reward is not the same as the reward for a Jew. It's It would be the same. Actually, this is what he writes. It's interesting. In Judaism, there are many commandments that men have to do and women are exempt. They should, they don't have to do them. The reward that a woman receives when she makes a commandment that men should be doing is the same reward that a non-Jew receives when he makes a commandment that, Jew, that a Jew should be doing. It's the same level. It's the same, it's my idea. So we're not saying here, ah, Jews and not Jews. Eh, no, no, no. We're talking about a, a, an idea of commandment as connection. Since the Jewish woman is not obligated, let's say, to put on to fill in. Fill means phylacteries you put in the head, in the arm. A woman, we, Jewish woman don't do it. Don't do it. There's, there was only one that is recorded actually in the Talmud that she, she, did, she did it. She, every day, she was Michal Bas Shaul. She was the wife of David Amalek, one of the wives of David Amalek. And nobody said anything to her because she was a very strong woman. So shut up, <laughs> let her do whatever she wants, and don't say anything. But it's one case, like, which woman today could say, I'm like Michal, the daughter of Shaul. Nobody does, believe me. No women do this. 
So if she does it, let's suppose, whatever she got crazy, she does it, what kind of reward does she receive? She was not commanded and she does it anywhere. It's a, anyway, it's a lower, lower level of reward. Okay. So now we understand the Rambam, we understand the Advas. Okay. These are like primary sources. So let's go one step further. Many rabbis want to say that what the Rambam writes and what the Radvas explain, it's not really literal. No, you cannot take it literally. They're not talking about any precept. No, no, no. They're only talking about whatever precept, whatever commandments make sense. What does that mean, make sense? There are many commandments in the Torah that you can see the, the utility that it has for the society. Like, don't steal. Okay. Besides the idea that God doesn't want us to steal for whatever reason, because he wants not <laughs> no, no stealing. Besides the idea, there's the idea of, okay, we see actually this is a good thing. I don't steal you. You don't steal me. So we can live in peace and everybody's happy. I have my things. You have your things. We can share whatever. I don't steal. You don't steal. Okay. We can live peacefully. And this is the main idea of the seven commandments for Renoyah, etc., to have a moral world, ethic world, peaceful world. That's good. That's fine. There are many commandments like that. Like, for instance, tzedakah, charity. It's not written that Bnei Noyak should do charity. It's not written, no. But if a person wants to help somebody else, of course, it makes perfect sense. I have money. You don't have money. I'm going to help you. Why not? Everybody's going to be happy. And God blesses me because I gave you. So everybody's happy. Every, everything works. Even though it's not directly commandment, com commanded, but he, won't, he can do it. Makes sense. So there's an opinion. This opinion is recorded. Actually, it's his opinion is recorded in the, the book Sheva Mitzvah Hashem, the seven commandments, the, the, the divine code. In English, it's called the divine code by Rabbi Moshe Weiner, which is an amazing book. Amazing book. Has lots of notes in the Hebrew. I don't know the English part, but the, the Hebrew part is amazing, amazing book. And he writes exactly this opinion: Bnei Noach should not do any other commandment rather than the seven commandments or anything that makes sense. What does that mean? Again, tzedakah, for instance, charity, or respect for father and mother. It's not written that they should do it. However. Any person that uh, has children or whatever, any adult understands that you have to respect your father and your mother. You might like them more or less. Okay, that's a different story. Go to your psychologist and he's going to help you. But in any case, it makes sense. You have to respect whomever gave you life. Makes sense. So those kinds of commandments, Bnei Noyach should do it because they make sense. Okay, it's also written in the Torah. Very nice. But it's written for Jews. So non-Jews can also do it. This is his opinion. This is his opinion. So where do we see a difference? Where do we see a difference? In precepts, commandments that don't make any sense. For instance, kashrut. Kashrut means the, the, the laws of eating. There's only one source, one place in the Midrash, whatever, I'm not going to explain all the details. Whoever understands, fine. Does, whoever doesn't understand, it's okay. Don't worry. In the Midrash, it's written that God will give reward to those non-Jews that did not eat pork. That's what it's written, whatever. So that means that all non-Jews should not eat pork? No. It's it, is it forbidden to eat pork for non-Jews? No, it's not forbidden. Not at all. Go enjoy yourself, whatever. Now, again, there's one source that says, okay, you want the reward, so don't eat the pork. But that, that, that it doesn't make it a commandment not to eat pork. Why? Because actually, all the laws of food for Jews do not make any sense. Zero. It's because God said, this animal is, I like it. This animal, I don't like it. It doesn't make any sense. Afterwards, our sages try to find ideas. And for instance, the Ramban, Nachmanides, lived 100 years after the Rambam, also in Spain. The Ramban writes something interesting that there are animals, those animals that the Torah prohibits, 
that have bad qualities inside, cruelty. And for instance, he writes about the pork, actually the Midrash writes, the pork, the, there are two signs whether animals could be kosher or not, uh, earth animals. This is something everybody knows. It's written in the Torah. has to be, I don't know the word in English, forget it, have many stomachs. I don't know how, it's getting, how to say this in English. As many, yeah, four stomachs, exactly. And has to have a split hook. Is what I know in English. <laughs> but many stomachs, I don't know how to say it in English. So has to have those two signs. Pork has only one stomach, like a regular human being, one stomach, but split hooves. So the idea the, that our sages write about the pork, he shows himself like a kosher animal. Look, I have split hooves. I'm, I'm, I'm nice. But on the inside, it's not kosher. It's not good. But you don't see it. You have to open it to see Whatever You don't see it. So it expresses it, the idea, and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking bad about the pork. Poor pork, it's, a, it's okay. God created the pork and whatever, whatever it does, it's okay. Uh, however, what it, what it symbolizes, what it expresses is a person that is hy hypocrite. How do you say? He shows himself in one way, but it's actually in a different way. It's not good. Inside is not good. Outside, everything looks nice, but inside is not good. So, this is something after the Torah says, don't eat the pork because of no reason, because we do not know the reason. Our sages say, look, we found uh, this idea. But it doesn't mean that everybody should not eat the pork because of this idea. No, not at all. Not at all. So again, the difference would be in those pre commandments that do not make sense. If you ask Rabbi Weiner, he's going to tell you, don't do them. No, you cannot. If you ask the Rambam and the Radvas in this other way of understanding it, and it's not me that understands it this way, there are other sources I did not, I, I didn't call them Hasam Soifer, the Mishnah Brura, whatever. There are other sources that understand this uh, this combination of Rambam and Radvas, just as I explained. You can you can effective, uh, effectively do those precepts. If you ask them, they're going to say yes, go do it. You have to do it properly. Go ask a Rabbi how to do it. You can do it. There are a few exceptions that even the Radvas, when he writes his commentary on the Rambam, says this. He says, leave it me gambling. My heart like makes noise. I don't like this idea. He this is what he writes. That a non-Jew should put on feeling. He says, no, no way. I don't like this idea. A non-Jew should have a right, a separate Torah, a book of the Torah. He says, no, no. Or should have mezuzah. In the door, and he says, No, I don't like this idea. Those three, I don't like it. This is what he writes. Interesting. He doesn't say, No, don't do it. He says, I don't like it. I don't like the idea. My heart, like in, in Yiddish, said, Mekishkes, like intestines, like remove and move. I don't like this idea. This is what he writes. Interesting. But the rest, yeah, why not? Yeah, why not? So if you go on the opinion of Aaron Weiner, and he's also based on the other ideas, Okay, so you should not do anything else than what it's written for you. And if you have doubts, ask a rabbi if it makes sense. If it's, if it's a commandment that makes sense, you can you can do it. And if it's a commandment that does not make sense, you should not do it. If you ask the other school of rabbis, so to speak, yeah, again, ask a rabbi whether really really is for you or not, whether you should really do it or not. But there's room to say, yeah, go do it. And not only go do it, you're going to receive reward by doing it, <laughs> which is like stronger. Because I can say, uh, whatever, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> and it doesn't make any sense. And God laughs at you and says, oh, what is this guy doing? So, no, no, you're going to receive reward. This is what the Rambam writes. This is what the Radvas like, actually agrees with the, with the Rambam. The Radvas agrees with him. <clears throat> now, once we understand what a commandment means, once we understand whether you can do it or not, the exceptions and the ideas, etc., there's another another two points, very important points. And afterwards, after these two points, actually, I'm going to do it before. There are two two points. The the Alter Rebbe, who's the founder of the Hasidic movement Chabad, he has many thousands, literally, of pages, thousands and thousands of pages of Hasidic discourses, explaining all kinds of things, all kinds of things. 
there's one line, very interesting line, that he writes about a non-Jew putting on tefillin. He writes specifically about this. Even though in that line, we're not going to read the whole text, it's really complex and long, but the, in this line he writes, interesting, he's giving it a, an example. He's not exactly talking about non-Jews, and he's not talking about feeling like the pre commandment of feeling. No, he gives it as an example. But in this example, he uses the following idea. If a Jew, he says like this, he, if a Jew fulfills a mitzvah, a commandment, so he receives whatever the reward that, that corresponds to that mitzvah. Now, if he thinks, knows, thinks all the laws about the, the this commandment, and he knows all the Kabbalah, the mystics behind the command, everything. He knows everything, but he doesn't do it. So it doesn't work. Nothing happens. That's what he's right. N nothing happens. And this is the, the interesting thing. It is as if you have that feeling in, in your table. You did not put it on. You, you have to put it in your head, in your arm. You left it in the table and you look at them and say, wow, feeling means A, B, C, D, woo, amazing things. You didn't do it. So it doesn't make, it, there's no result in the world. And then he writes, the same thing happens if a non-Jew puts on the tefillin. Nothing happens in the world. There's no result in the world. This is what he writes. It's interesting. <laughs> Nothing happens. I don't know, and I'm not, again, an authority to say, the same applies to all other commandments, or he was talking specifically about tefillin. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not an authority, but I do know, and I just read it to you, the Rambam clearly says, if you want to do other, all the other commandments, go ahead, do it properly again, ask a rabbi, and, and do it properly. But go ahead and do it. Is it the same reward as a Jew? No. But it is a reward? There is a reward? Yes? Okay. This is one point about the Alter Rebbe, like a little bit more mystic things behind it. And this gives, like, opens a, a different realm. There's another Hasidic discourse that I shared it actually with, with Rabbi Weiner. I shared the discourse and he said to me, through a different person, Michal, Michal, he said to me, look, I don't think this is something, this is something you should actually <laughs> share with everybody. But to me, I, like the Radvas writes, my, my intestines are moving, you know, why not? If we have a, a great sage that wrote this, and it is like available. Why not? Why not sharing it? Who wrote this? This is something that wrote the Rebbe Maharash. Rebbe Maharash is the fourth Hasidic uh, Rebbe of Chabad. Shmuel, that was his name. He lived in Lubavitch, a small town, very small place uh, there in, in the south of Russia. And he writes in, in one discourse that actually afterward, afterwards is taken by one of his sons, that was the next, the fifth Rebbe of Chabad, Rebbe Rashab. And he actually mentions this also, that when the first man, Adam, Adam Arishan, that of course is the father of everybody, <laughs> we're all his children, when Adam Arishan was, a, when the first man was kicked out of the paradise, the reason why he was kicked out of the paradise is because God wanted the whole world to be refined. If he stayed specifically... <laughs> I'm not going to enter in the argument. I'm sorry that I interrupt, but I'm not going to enter in the argument. Did he do right, wrong? He ate. Okay, this, let's leave that for a different time. But the, the reality, and the, the thing is, the story is, he was kicked out. Okay. If he would have stayed in the paradise, the whole world wouldn't have been a refined place. The whole world would have been a, a terrible place. And God didn't want this. So he was kicked out. Like, this is part of the plan. It's interesting. He was kicked out, and by doing this, God gave him a mission to him and to all his children, and I include non-Jews on all his children. God gave him a mission. The mission is to refine the world. How do you refine the world? So, okay, there are two answers. Answer number one, by doing commandments. When you do, for instance, we're talking about feeling. So you take that feeling, actually, what are they made of? They're made of cow, the, the, the leather of the cow, and the ink, and all kinds of materials. When you actually fulfill a commandment with those materials, you elevate. This is called in Hebrew, birurim, refinements, or whatever, whoever knows, 
this, this is what is called birurim, avoidas a birurim, the, the work of refinement of the whole world. How do you refine the world? By doing commandments with the world. Now, where where is the rest, so to speak, actually, majority of all the children of Adam, of, of the first man, Jews are a very, very small minority. How do you expect them to refine the whole world? It's impossible. So how do you do that? Everybody, Jews and non-Jews, have to use the world, I mean the material world, in order to serve God. When you eat something, okay, so you're taking vegetables or a cow, whatever you're eating, doesn't matter, and you're using this to have strength, to pray, to be kind with other people, to uh, disseminate uh, morality, ethics, etc., etc., etc. So that food becomes a refined thing, a godly thing. This is what it means, actually, refined, godly thing. We, re we reveal God in the world by using the world to serve him. How do you reveal God? Because when you take a piece of food and you make a blessing, the, the idea, the main idea of the blessing is to recognize that this food actually belongs to God and he wants me to reveal him in the world. So when I say the blessing, I, I actually recognize myself and I teach anybody who's watching me or hearing me, whatever, that there's a God, he's the creator of the world, there's, he gave us food, he wants us to eat, because if I don't eat, I, I die. He wants us to eat, but before eating, he wants us to recognize that actually everything belongs to him. He created everything. This is what it means, revealing God by eating. You're going to ask, hey, wait, if I do a commandment, I reveal God, whatever. But eating, yeah, by eating, you can reveal God. And you, and you can make the eating itself service to God. So this is what the Rebbe Maharaj, not in this exact word, whatever. This is what the Rebbe Maharaj writes in that discourse. The first man was kicked out of the of the Ganeidin, of the of the paradise to refine the whole world, and everybody has a mission. Everybody has a specific mission into this idea of refinement of the world. I live wherever I live, you live wherever you live, and we reveal God in those places and in our way of being, way of talking, whatever. The same thing, same idea, exactly same idea, appears actually in the Torah itself, God told Moses to write the Torah in 70 languages. When he, when, when the Jews were about to enter the land, etc. Why should he write in 70 languages? Today there are more than 70 languages, it doesn't matter, but for what? All the Jews that were there, they all knew Hebrew, they all knew the Torah, so to speak, they, they had it to read it. Why do you need it in 70 languages? Who spoke those languages? Nobody. I mean, from the Jews that received the Torah over there, Nobody spoke those languages. Maybe Egyptian, whatever, some guys that remember still Egyptian after 40 years. Why do you need it for? In the commentaries, Rashi brings these as a commentary, in one of the main commentaries. He says, for the other nations. So there's an idea of other nations learning Torah. Okay, we can discuss which part yes, which part no. Okay, it's a different discussion. But th there is such an idea. And there is such an idea of sharing the message of Judaism for everybody, everybody, everywhere. Okay, so this is what the Rebbe Marash writes about Bidurim. So the same thing we could say, again, I'm not an authority, but we could say that by, by fulfilling certain commandments that are actually for Jews, but you're not a, you, you're a non-Jew that wants to fulfill those commandments, there is probably, a I underline the word probably because I'm not an authority of mystics to say, etc., etc. There is some refinement over there. The Alter Rebbe writes about feeling and non Jew put on feelings like it's feeling in the table is the same thing. But again, maybe only be a place to feeling. I don't know. I don't know. And the Raman clearly writes you can fulfill mitzvot and you receive some reward. So there is some refinement in the world. But again, Every case has to be presented to a rabbi that understands what you're talking about, and the rabbi should be able to give you guidance on whether you should do this or not. Okay, next step. There are all the precepts, all the commandments that are not written in the Torah, and those commandments are rabbinic commandments. There are seven, actually, rabbinical commandments. One of them, for instance, that we spoke about is blessings. 
in the in the Torah itself, in the text itself, there's only one blessing that is recited after the meals. There's a whole text or whatever that has to be recited. That uh, it's it's appropriate to mention, even though we're not talking about this particular thing. But the text that is written for Jews does not make any sense for a non-Jew to read. Doesn't make any sense at all. And if you read it, just take the take the sidur, the the praying book of a Jew, and read it, and you're gonna see, hey, this is not talking about me. <laughs> what am I reading? Like God gave us the land, and God gave us the Torah, and God gave us this sign. And the, the, what, what are you reading? Sounds very nice. Grace after meals, but the text itself doesn't make any sense. So there are texts for non-Jews. I mean, you can say, and you should say, grace after meals, a, a, a blessing before the meals, definitely, but not the same text. Doesn't make any sense. The, the blessing before the meals usually is, is the same for Jews and non-Jews. Makes sense. That text makes sense. So what, what I want to say with this is, and, and I close like the parentheses, I'm, I'm not talking about blessings now, but what I want to say with this is, Things have to have to have a common sense. If you're just doing things because you're doing things, doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's like a circle, but whatever. It doesn't make sense. What are you doing? It's like I was born in Argentina. I'm an Argentina, and I thank God that He made me an American. I mean, in the United States. It's not true. I was not born there. I'm not American. I'm, I was born in Argentina. So what am I saying? Why should I recite a blessing to God because he made me whatever something he did not make me? Doesn't make sense. Okay. We close like the parenthesis. But blessings is one of the one of the seven rabbinical commandments. Other two of those commandments are Hanukkah and Purim. The the idea that actually fired this whole class. Was for me, I was supposed to be talking about Hanukkah. It's been 45 minutes talking about something else, but well, whatever. <laughs> that's that's what you got. Um, those two are uh, uh, stories that happen. The story is actually very known and very easy to find anywhere. You can do Hanukkah, what's Hanukkah, you, even Wikipedia, which is not actually a good source, but whatever. Some things are right. Yeah, you can find over there what's the whole story. Just very, very, very briefly, the story of Purim actually happened before Hanukkah. Purim happened around 350 years before Common Era. And Hanukkah happened around 150 years after, uh, before, I'm sorry, before the Common Era. Both before the Common Era. Around that. Purim is about the destruction after the destruction of the first temple, Jews were in Persia and whatever, whatever is Iran today. And there's a whole story with Esther, the queen, and Mordechai. Okay, you can read the story. You can read the book of Esther. It's very, very easy. After that story, the next year, our sages said, let's celebrate this. It was a great miracle. Let's celebrate. And there are very specific ways in which we Jews celebrate Purim. You have to read a text in the night, in the morning. Okay, so there's a whole thing how to celebrate Purim. Hanukkah, pretty much the same idea. The second temple was built, but the Syrian Greeks conquered the, the land and they did not they didn't, didn't destroy the temple, they just entered and then made a whole mess in the temple. And there was a group of Jews, Maccabees, that's what they was they were called. And they recovered control of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, the, the temple. They cleaned the place. They wanted to light the, the menorah, the, the candelabra. They didn't find oil. There was a miracle over there. Okay, you can find the text and ideas uh, in anywhere, actually, today. Anyway, you don't need me to, to tell the story. And afterwards, next year, our sages also said, hey, let's celebrate this. <laughs> it's interesting that every time Jews suffer, we get a new Yom Tov. We get a new party. <laughs> it's interesting. Actually, today, today is the U, the tenth, tenth of Kislev, or the month of Kislev. It's also a party because the, the second Chabad rabbi, Mitel Rebbe, was called Doiber, was imprisoned, which is also a whole thing in itself. It's interesting that in Chabad, it doesn't happen the same thing in other, other movements, other Jewish movements. In Chabad, almost except for one, our Rebbe, 
the rest all were in prison, all were in jail. So we're, you know, good guys. <laughs> you have good rabbis. <laughs> all were in jail. All have like a thing, I don't know what it's called in English, prontuarios in Spanish, like a whole story of being in jail. Uh, good guys. Okay, so today actually uh, celebrates that he was liberated from, from prison. Uh, I, in the year 1826, 1826, many years ago. So whatever, okay. So every time we have suffering, we have a new party. That's what Purim and Hanukkah mean, basically. Those are rabbinical uh, uh, festivities, rabbinical celebrations. Should Bnei Noyach do them or not? Okay. So let's put things into place. If you ask the Rambam and the Raivad the way we understood it, like we read the, the sources, etc., they're going to say, yeah, why not? Why not? If you can actually refrain yourself from, from eating something, you're not supposed to refrain yourself, but it's okay. Or you can give tzedakah, or you can, whatever, do other commandments. Why not Hanukkah? Why not Purim? Be happy. Go do them. But if you ask Rabbi Weiner, the way I understand it, he should say, no, don't do this. What, what's, the, what's the meaning? Does it really make sense? Because you like candles in your house. Are you going to make anything better in the world? If you help somebody else, you give them money, you give an advice, whatever. So you're actually increasing good goodness in the world. But if you like candles in your house, what are you increasing? Okay, you can say light. Okay, light is a symbol of goodness and light and the light of Torah and the light of whatever. You could say this. But the same thing could, you could do anywhere, any day. Tonight, go and light candles. Why not? Or light 10 candles, 200 candles. What even does it make? If you want to make light, so go make light. You say the light has a symbol. Okay, that's fine. It's, it, it's not wrong, but it doesn't have anything to do with Hanukkah. And one more step. This is my humble opinion. I did, I did not see this written anywhere. But both Hanukkah and Purim... I understand that they mean the, the prevalence of goodness over, over bad. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But after all, for a non-Jew, should sound weird. Because Jews are actually celebrating, hey, we defeated non-Jews. So wait a second. If I'm non-Jew, why should I celebrate that these guys defeated? <laughs> I don't know. To me, it doesn't make sense. But this is my own... <laughs> Problem. I, I, I make it very clear. I did not see this written anywhere. So again, should non-Jews celebrate Hanukkah? Depends on who you ask, and depends on what are you actually understanding when you do this. I'm not saying you should not, but depends on who you ask. Mm -hmm.